God, be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God, let all the people praise you. O let the people, the nations be glad and sing for joy for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Let's ask God's blessing upon us. We thank you again, our gracious God and Heavenly Father, that we can gather in your presence, coming before your throne with the worship and adoration of our hearts. And we pray the enabling power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that you should be pleased, honoured and exalted in all that takes place in this gathering today. For Jesus' sake. Amen. This evening from the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 7, and from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. Daniel 7 and Mark 8. Daniel 7 from verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold one like the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. And then from the Gospel of Mark, reading from verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me for three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and they set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said, set them also before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments, Now those who had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away, immediately got into the boat with his disciples, and came to the region of Dalmanutha. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, No sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of fragment did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. Also when I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large basketfuls of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. So he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on them, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, 
I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us tonight. Let's come now to God in prayer. Let us all pray. Again, Lord, we are struck with the sheer awesome nature of that in which we're involved this evening in drawing near to the throne of heaven. We come to the throne upon which the Ancient of Days now sits, the one to whom all authority in heaven and in earth has been given, the one who has been delivered a kingdom which will never pass away. And coming to so great and high and holy, a King and Lord, we are humbled in your presence, and yet we are overwhelmed with a sense of the wonder of your grace that you call us to draw near, and the immense privilege that belongs to us as the sons of the living God that we can stand in your presence, in the presence of the Holy One, the Maker of heaven and earth, that we who are but dust and ashes may nonetheless come near to you, to you who before whose throne and whose face the angels veil their eyes and veil their feet and ever cry, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his, his glory and Yet you bid us draw near. We thank you for this privilege. And we come then humbling ourselves before you. And yet filled with a sense of joyful awe. That we can come with the praise and worship and adoration of our heart. Because of our mediator. The Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you sent him into the world. We thank you for the power of his person and of his words. We bless you that words spoken by him two millennia ago are here before us again tonight and sounding in our ears and we know the power of them what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul we thank you for a saviour who tells us about the value of our souls when we for so long have been careless of our souls and careless of the day of judgment to be reminded we can lose our soul, but that our Saviour has come to redeem us and to make us his own and to give us eternal life. Lord, we bless you for him and for his gracious words. We thank you that coming to him we have found rest 
we found eternal life, acceptance with God. And we bless you then for this Saviour. And we pray that as the gospel is being preached tonight, not only in this place, but throughout our land, in congregations large and small, and throughout this world, in congregations gathered in buildings and in forests and in fields, in all manner of places, the name of the Lord Jesus is being exalted and preached in the world today. We thank you that you are by these means gathering men and women and boys and girls into the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And you are establishing and bringing to completion your glorious plan and purpose. We thank you that your purpose has always been that you would gather in a company of people innumerable, as many as the sand upon the seashore, uh, so that they are beyond our ability to compute and to count up, and that in that last day, in that great day of the Lord, we will be overwhelmed by the wonder of it all, what God has done in saving not only Israel, but saving the Gentile nations too, and gathering them into your kingdom. Thank you that the gospel has come to us here in 2023, in this little village of Mysokuma, that your word is amongst us, and powerfully so, transforming us and making us more like your son. And we thank you that throughout the world there are those who today, faithful to your word, are proclaiming it in the ears of all manner of different people. People we will not meet in this world. People whom if we did meet, we may be unable to converse with them. Every language and tribe uh, you call your people from. So we bless you that we belong to a, a vast number, all united in our living head, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he builds a glorious body that one day will be without spot or blemish or any such thing presented with great joy to the Holy Father. Lord, we bless you for our privileges then. We ask that we would live in the light of them and uh, especially tonight as we come to your word that we would know what it is to be faithful uh, to your word and not ashamed of it. That uh, the Lord Jesus, his authority as our God and Saviour, as our living uh, Redeemer and Lord, uh, might be acknowledged in our lives. We ask these mercies, Lord, with your kind and your generous compassion to those who stand in need. We commit to you, our dear brother Malcolm, again tonight, asking that you'd be with him, that as our lives continue, as they have done, we're so conscious that for him uh, it's as if his life has come to a stop. We pray that you'd help him in his grief and in his sadness and restore to him a measure of joy. We thank you for all that Jen was to us as a congregation and to him as a wife and to his dear family. Help them, Lord, in their loss, we pray. We remember our dear sister Leah also, that you'd have mercy upon her as she continues this arduous treatment. We pray that it would be successful and uh, it would have a good result in her body. Lord, hear our prayers as we pray for Harry and for Hethwin as they contemplate marriage uh, next weekend, that you'd make that a glorious and a blessed day, that you'd bless their marriage and make them eminently useful and fruitful servants of the Lord Jesus uh, as we ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. So again, those words at the close of Mark chapter 8. From verse 34, when he had called the people to himself and his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. 
Well, last week we began looking at uh, Luke 21, 33 to examine what it is that the Lord Jesus teaches us concerning his own words. The theme might seem a little bit strange uh, to you, but it ought not because the basis of all that we have to say here and to teach is, of course, the authority of the Lord Jesus and his teaching in the scriptures of all the great themes concerning life and so on, Uh, and much more. The teaching of Jesus lies at the very heart of our faith. And if we're going to teach the faith to other people, um, Christ's teaching being made known to them, then as we prepare to do that, we have to ask the question, by what authority does Jesus say the things that he says? We have to ask his own view of his own teaching. What does Jesus say about his own words? So we're looking tonight at verse 38 of Mark 8, um, which uh, tells us this. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Anybody uh, familiar with the Gospels knows that from the, the very beginning, people regarded Jesus as a teacher. That is what the word rabbi means, except that Jesus never trained in any official capacity as a rabbi. For example, if you just look over to uh, verse 5 of chapter 9, Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Verse 17, one of the crowd answered and said, to the, and said Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. Verse Verse uh, 38, John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone else who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. That's the way in which people ordinarily referred to the Lord Jesus. Obviously, Jesus did mighty miracles and people were aware of that, but primarily they saw him as a teacher. And the verdict of ordinary people on the teaching of Jesus was that no one had ever spoken like him, no one had ever taught like him uh, before. And so we read over and again, and they marveled at his teaching. Now, they might have thought that his teaching was marvellous, but what we're looking at here is what he thought about his teaching. His verdict upon the things that he said. And the unifying phrase then between the text last week and the text this week are those words, my words. My words. Last week we looked at the statement, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And we saw then that if his words are never going to pass away, then they must be divine words, because only God is eternal. They must be words of God. And if his words are never going to pass away, his words must be contemporary. That they were as, as powerful in the 21st century as they were in the 1st century, when he first spoke those words. And then we saw that the whole context there in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, in that chapter 21, is that of the sufferings that would befall the people of God in future generations. And we saw from that, by implication, if his words will never pass away, then those words were indestructible. Those words would have a power that would mean they could not be overthrown by any power ranged against uh, the church by the enemies of the Lord Jesus. It will remain a power in the world until Jesus comes again. So it's a marvellous statement by Jesus about his own words that we looked at last week. He was conscious that every time he opened his mouth, every time he spoke and taught uh, as the saviour of the world, as the son of God, his words that he spoke would not simply be heard by the people to whom he was addressing at that time, but they would be recorded and that they would be spoken to us. They would never pass away. Who, who could have thought in those days as they stood and listened to Jesus 
that 2,000 years later there would be churches all over the world where the words of Jesus would be spoken and meditated upon and believed and obeyed. So I want us this evening to look at this second and equally astonishing a, a pronouncement of Jesus, a statement of incredible weight and power. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now the immediate context of these words is the discovery made by the disciples to their astonishment of who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. Uh, we're told in verse 29 where Peter says, you are the Christ. And then to their great dismay, their disciples are told what is going to happen to this messianic king for whom they've been waiting when he goes up to Jerusalem. Far from gathering his followers together and taking the throne of the nation at Jerusalem, he said, what he says shatters them. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And then in addition to that, from verse 34, uh, he goes on to show them what the way of the cross will mean for his disciples then and now for all time. So it includes not only the disciples who were before him when he spoke these words, but us also. He tells us what is the cost of discipleship. And he spells that out very plainly from verse 34 to 38. He doesn't hide from his disciples the downside of following him. He doesn't water it down in order to encourage people to give their allegiance uh, to him. In verse 38, then he has this plain speaking statement about what it means to follow him. And though I shouldn't have to, I do have to say, when you look at these verses, Jesus means exactly what he says. This isn't just talk. This is the only way in which you and I can be disciples of the Lord Jesus. So if you are not willing to follow this way, you shouldn't claim to be a Christian. You see, it seems to me that many people who profess to be believers think that this is just talk. As if Jesus was some kind of indulgent mother who doesn't discipline her children. You know the kind of thing. You will have seen it. You will have heard it. Here's little Timmy and you hear his mother on the bus and she's saying, oh, stop it, Timmy. No, Timmy, stop it. Timmy, no, no. And it goes on and on and on. And some little old lady gets on the bus and says, what a lovely little boy. Aren't you a good little boy? And his mother says, yes, he's a good little boy. And you think, no, he's not a good little boy. Indulgent. And little Timmy has learned that it doesn't matter how many times mum says no, she's never going to follow through and stop him. He knows he can do just what he wants. But what Jesus says, he means. And if we don't follow his instructions, then what we will find is that the Christian life for us won't be in any way satisfying to us. Perhaps that's why so many professing Christians are so dissatisfied, unfruitful and anemic and insipid and as, as weak as dishwater. Jesus means what he says, and when he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed, he means that. He means it. So I'm going to divide this text into three, three uh, headings, so it'll give you uh, an idea of where we're going. And the first is a real danger, and then a considerable pressure, and then a terrible verdict. So that's the three headings we have tonight. And you can see the first here, this 
real danger. It's the danger of being ashamed of Jesus and ashamed of the words of Jesus. I doubt very much that there's a Christian anywhere in the world who has not been tempted to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian who claims never to have been ashamed of Jesus is a very rare breed indeed, I think, if, if they exist at all. It's a universal experience of all Christians, it seems to me, in every generation, in all ages, through all the world, that at some time or another they are embarrassed to confess Christ in, in certain circumstances and to certain people. If we take a stand for Christ, we know from our earliest days as Christians what it is to be called a Bible basher or a Holy Joe or a Puritan. From school days through working days, all our life, we know what it is to be embarrassed to take a stand for the Bible and for God's word in our working life or whatever it is, we know that embarrassment, that sense of shame, people challenging us and then us being afraid, fearful, because we are far from the support of other Christian friends and so on. That's part of the fear that we all endure, every, you know, every one of us all our life standing out and being different from the crowd. We all know that feeling. But this word ashamed that Jesus here uses means more than being a little bit embarrassed. That's not what this word means. What the word means is being unwilling to acknowledge. If a man is unwilling to acknowledge me and my words, that's what Jesus means here. If you're not willing to acknowledge me and my teaching, then on that great day, I will not acknowledge you. And there are in this phrase then two parts that are absolutely inseparable. There is this unbreakable link between Jesus and his teaching. Jesus says to his disciples, they're not to be ashamed of me and my words. He could have simply said, couldn't he? don't be ashamed of me. Could have said that. And that would have conveyed, really, all the meaning that was necessary. But he doesn't. He says, me and my words. You're not to be ashamed of me. You're not to be ashamed of my words. And what Jesus means, obviously, is that I cannot be loyal to Jesus Christ, unashamed of Jesus before the world today, and at the same time, be disloyal to his words or any part of his words. If I'm going to be loyal to Christ and unashamed of him in the 21st century and in the latter 21st century when I'm sure it's going to be even more difficult to be loyal to him, if I'm going to be loyal to him, I have to be loyal to what he says. Me and my words are inseparable. And yet, as we know, there have been and there are many people today who want to force a wedge there and to separate Jesus from his words. That has been a major aim in theological studies uh, for over 120 years now. And there are many people who have written books who want to stand up and say that they are loyal to Jesus, but they have to question the validity of Jesus' teaching. Many of those who are regarded by society at large today as leaders of the church who claim to be followers of Christ nonetheless feel completely free to deny the validity of the teaching of Jesus. There's a popular writer, I won't mention his name, but there is a popular writer who wrote a popular book a few years ago in which he popularized the idea that what has been taught in theological colleges now for several, well, for a hundred years, uh, that, that this is true, that the Jesus of history and the Jesus of the Bible are two different things. And he says that what we have to do in searching out the Jesus of history is to sieve what we read in the Bible. He says you have to strip away the words and the teachings of Jesus that the church in the early centuries attached to him 
and attributed to him. And then you'll find this holy, this Galilean holy man. That's really all that Jesus is. Nothing more than that. Just a travelling Galilean holy man. And that what you've got in the Gospels then is what the early church taught. That's what he said. Not what Jesus actually said. And that the early church clearly got it wrong. And so you have to reinterpret all those words until you arrive at what Jesus was really like. And for that particular man, that was a very convenient, comfortable thing to do. Because then he could say that he was a Christian, but live exactly as he pleased. Which is just what he did. Because although he was a professing Christian, he left his wife to marry a younger woman. Why not? Why shouldn't he do that? But if these words are the words of Jesus, how could he handle a verse such as Mark chapter 10 and verse 11? Where Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And so he simply said, Jesus didn't say that. So it doesn't matter how he lives, and even if he did, they're only the words of a Galilean holy man. Now I didn't re mention that man's name, because after decades of living like that and speaking like that, he actually found repentance and turned to the Saviour. So I won't mention his name tonight. Now, that kind of attitude to the word of Jesus began, as they say, about 120 years ago, or a little over 120 years ago, with ministers who had been sort of overawed by scientific advance and technological advances in their day. And trying to keep abreast of modern thinking, these ministers were trying to say, we must be loyal to Jesus, but it's doubtful, if not impossible, that he actually ever worked miracles. And as you might expect, it wasn't long before they were saying, well, if the Bible is wrong about his miracles, well, perhaps it's wrong about his words too. And so then, as now, they denied the second coming, and they denied what Jesus taught about the judgment to come. They denied his claims to be co-eternal with God and so on. And they began to construct a Jesus that they could sit more comfortably with and a Jesus who was more comfortable with them and approved of them as they are and were. And they selected then bits and pieces of the Bible, of the teaching of Jesus that supported his view what they wanted to believe Jesus was like. And that meant stripping away everything he said about judgment and hell and all the exclusive claims that Jesus make. Those all had to be jettisoned. Back in the 1980s, there was a, a man who became a leader of a prominent, the most powerful union in, in the country at that time. And... Uh, he said at it, when he was appointed that he was a Christian and that he'd been brought up on Sankey's hymns and so on. And uh, a journalist began to press him on that statement and said, well, do you believe the Apostles' Creed? And he edged a little bit and was being put under pressure by this journalist until in the end he says, well, I do believe in Christianity in this sense. Notice those words in this sense, that I believe Jesus was a socialist. In this sense. Now you can't be too harsh on that man, because that phrase is just so characteristic of our age, isn't it? You see, what he'd actually done was chosen his own Christ. He wanted a socialist Christ, so he interpreted Christ as a socialist. And almost everybody behaves like that. Oh yes, I believe in Jesus in this sense. But when we turn to Jesus and his words in the Gospels, you find that Jesus actually interprets himself. He tells us what we are to think about him and in what sense we must understand him. 
And so, for instance, um, in in John 6, we have the Lord Jesus feeding the 5,000. And it's not uncommon now to hear preachers, even in evangelical churches, sadly, speaking about that miracle and saying what it means is that we must feed the poor, the starving. Now, of course, we must do that. But is that what the feeding of the 5,000 is meant to teach us? Is that what that miracle is intended to convey? Well, no. Jesus himself goes on to tell us what it means. Because later he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. That's the meaning of the miracle. And all through the Gospels we have these pictures. A miracle that is performed, and then Jesus telling us what it means. He doesn't leave us to guess and to interpret for ourselves. He heals a blind man in John chapter 9. What does he teach? I am the light of the world. He raises Lazarus from the dead. What does he say? I am the resurrection and the life. It's like looking then at a children's storybook or a children's piece of art in school, I should say. And, uh, and there are all these blobs and splashes of colour and it's just a random splodge of meaningless marks of paint and we ask, well, what is it? And the child says, well, it's a tree. Obviously, it's a tree. You would never have known if the child hadn't told you. And that's how it is with Jesus. You can never understand Jesus apart from his own teaching, his own interpretation of the acts that he performs. Apart from Jesus' words, we would be hopelessly adrift on a sea of subjectivism. You see, it isn't enough for us to acknowledge Jesus. It depends what kind of Jesus we're acknowledging. If it's the Jesus who reveals himself in the Gospels, all well and good. And if not, it's just a figment of your imagination. His words, you see, tie us down. His words make certain what our understanding must be. He says, this is who I am. This is what I am like. This is why I have come. He paints the picture, as it were, and underneath writes the words, this is what you're looking at. And so instead of being cast adrift on this sea of subjectivism and, and speculation, he gives his own definitive, objective interpretation of himself. And you can see that, for example, in verse 38 itself. Look at what he says. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed. That's the title Jesus gives himself. What does that mean, the Son of Man? Whenever Jesus talks about himself, he uses that phrase, doesn't he? It's only ever found on his lips. No one else calls Jesus the Son of Man. Only Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And it's one of the most striking titles in the Gospels. It's the title Jesus gives himself... Nobody would have dreamt of calling Jesus the Son of Man. It finds its origin in that passage we read earlier in Daniel chapter 7. If you've got your Bible, perhaps you'll just quickly turn back to it. Daniel chapter 7 and verse, verse 13. I don't claim to clearly understand all the visions of Daniel, but this particular part of his vision is extraordinarily clear. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now isn't it remarkable that Jesus should lift from that vision the name by which he wished to be known? 
the name of the one who in human form comes into the presence of Almighty God and is worshipped by all creation, is given authority and glory and praise by God himself. Do you see what Jesus is doing then in verse 38? He's defined for us who he is and how we must think about him. And he says, I want you to acknowledge me and my words about me, that I am the one who comes to the Ancient of Days and is to be worshipped by all peoples and all nations. That's what Jesus is saying there. It's astonishing, isn't it? You see, you can't hope to know and follow Jesus without loyalty to his words, his teaching. And if you take away his words and his works, you've got no evidence left, have you, for his deity, and he's simply brought down to the level of an ordinary man. In the end, when we're confronted by people who want to reinterpret and reinvent Jesus, as so many do, you have to ask, where's your evidence for that? Where's your evidence? You see, the only Jesus there is for whom we have any evidence is this supernatural figure who makes these stupendous claims about himself. That's the only evidence that we have. And there's no evidence at all for a Jesus who did no miracles. No evidence at all for a Jesus who did not claim to be God. And if we are to be faithful disciples to Jesus, this is the Jesus we must acknowledge and follow. So you tell your friends what Jesus said about himself. Many of them will be surprised. Many of them will be really surprised. They may have heard a lot of nonsense before. Well, you tell them the truth. And they'll say, did he really say that? That he alone has the words of eternal life? That no one comes to the Father except through him? And the only way we can acknowledge Jesus is by paying attention to his words then. There is no other Christ but the Christ of these words. So there's a real danger, the danger of being ashamed of him and his words. The second thing I want us to notice in verse 38 is the world in which we live and the kind of pressure it brings to bear upon, uh, upon the disciples of Christ. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, he says. Now, now what does that phrase mean, an adulterous and a sinful generation? Um, we, we use the same phrase, don't we, today, in our generation, or in my father's generation. Or we'll say, in, in our time. Or in our day, in our in our day, most people, the most popular food seems to be beef burgers. Or we say, in our day, the churches are largely empty in Britain. In our time, in our day, in our generation, those those phrases generally mean the same thing. It makes little difference between between them. So Jesus is saying that in his day, Israel, the Jewish nation was an adulterous people. Well, does he mean by that that adultery and immorality and licentiousness were, were more common then in the first century amongst the Jews? Well, that's very unlikely. The Jews then, as now, have high, very, very high standards of morality. So I don't think he means this literally. What he's doing is using this word adulterous in, in uh, the way that it was commonly used in the Old Testament scriptures. And they would understanding, understand Jesus to be using as a reference to spiritual apostasy. All through the Old Testament scriptures in the prophets, this, phrase of a, this word adultery was used uh, to speak of their apostasy from God. They were married to the living God, but they forsook him for another husband. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 
31 and verse 32. Uh, they forsook him for another husband. It's very interesting that the word Baal or Baal in the Old Testament uh, in Hebrew means husband. They forsook the living God for another husband when they went after Baal, uh, a false protector. So we have in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 32, uh, t speaking about the new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. See, the man who leaves his wife breaks covenant. The man who promises to be a husband to his wife and then fails to be faithful to her, fails to keep his promise, has broken covenant and he's adulterous. And in a spiritual sense, then doing that in relation to God, they were idolatrous. To be to turn from the living God to another protector is to turn to an idol. That is idolatry. And an idol is a God that I make in my own image. And idolatry is universal, isn't it? Even today. Idolatry is selecting things about God that I'm prepared to believe in and rejecting others. When people select from the story of Jesus the bits they like and reject the rest, they're committing adultery, they're committing idolatry. And that's happening all the time. Every time you hear someone say, I like to think of God, or I like to think of Jesus like this, you are listening to an idolater. That's someone committing idolatry. Because what you think about God, and the kind of Jesus you like to think about, that's quite irrelevant. It's quite meaningless. It doesn't alter the truth concerning Jesus. But people are doing that all the time, committing idolatry, choosing a God who is all right, a God who doesn't interfere with them, who doesn't place demands upon them, a God like that indulgent mother of little Timmy who condones all my weaknesses, who gives me just what I want, who never says no and means it. That's an idol. But when you show people what Jesus Christ really is like, what he really did say, and the fact that he meant what he said, well, immediately they react to that, don't they? And they say, well, I, I can't believe that. I can't believe God would be angry with me or with anybody else. And surely Jesus can't be the only way for me to know God? Surely not. An adulterous generation is a generation who has known God, has known something about the love and the faithfulness of God, and yet they turn to love other gods. Hasn't that happened in our country? Didn't our forefathers, former generations, know God and know his love and his faithfulness, and yet our generation has turned to idols? In some cases, quite literally. In other cases, we still acknowledge Jesus but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. And then the word sinful there means going your own way. Going deliberately against the commandments of God. Well, did Jesus mean then that his generation, that first century, uh, was a particularly disloyal generation to the covenant? Well, no, this, this gospel was written after, wasn't it? The resurrection and the ascension. It's written by his faithful servants. And they write these words because they know that it's applicable not only to their own time, but it's applicable to our time too. And that's the pressure that's always facing the people of God. That's why it's so difficult for us to acknowledge the real Jesus. Because our generation has turned away from him. Ours is a wicked and adulterous generation. No longer do our churches love the living God. They've turned from him and have gone their own way. No wonder the church is so pitifully weak today. 
So this, there's this immense pressure brought to bear on us. We live in an adulterous and a sinful generation that despises the Lord and despises his Christ and they defy you to be loyal to him and faithful to him. And there's then a real danger that we may become unwilling to acknowledge Jesus and unwilling to acknowledge his words as a result of that immense pressure. And then finally and quickly, the third thing is this, this terrible verdict that Jesus gives. Look at the final clause. We live in an adulterous and a sinful generation. We live alongside churches, many of which have become unfaithful to the covenant. And the pressures that those exert on us means that it's very easy for us not to acknowledge Jesus and his teaching. And so we are given this terrible verdict. On that glorious day, he says, the Son of Man will not acknowledge us, if that's the case, when he comes in his Father's glory with all the holy angels. What a day that will be. Here is the Son of Man of Daniel chapter 7, to whom all the nations have been given. And he comes to take what is his own and he's surrounded by the blazing glory of the father and he's attended by myriads of holy angels it's a picture isn't it of overwhelming power and wonder and love and praise but will it be like that for us for you what will it be like for the church in britain today you see let's understand what jesus is saying here this isn't like the children's game of tit for tat he's not saying you were ashamed of me so i'll be ashamed of you in that day that's that's not what's going on this is the sober inevitable response of jesus if we refuse to acknowledge christ refuse to acknowledge his teaching if we turn to an imaginary christ one who is more suitable to our particular fancies in life then that was a Jesus of our creation that is a God that we make for ourselves that is an idol and we've given up allegiance to our true husband and we've given our love to an idol which really means to ourselves and what he will do on that great day is to recognize that we have never been true lovers of him and followers of him he will not recognize those who in their day and generation were not willing to bear the smallest amount of shame that is the lot that befalls those who truly follow him and walk in his steps. But for those who do, he will acknowledge them as true disciples, he says. A few years ago there was a pastor in Iran called Pastor Mehdi Deebja. He was imprisoned for converting to the Lord Jesus from Islam. He was imprisoned for 10 years. He suffered torture. And for two years, he was confined in a cell measuring only three feet square. He was eventually brought to court, and his defense was actually printed in full in the Times newspaper. There's many things that could be said about it. It was deeply moving. But the most striking thing he, that came through was his unflinching loyalty to Jesus and his words. It was once said of John Bunyan, that, uh, who, who'd spent himself 12 years in prison, that the Bible was in his blood. And that's what it was like for this, this pastor in Iran. This is what he said. Jesus is our saviour and he is the son of God. To know him means to know eternal life. I, a useless sinner, have believed in his beloved person and all his words and miracles recorded in the Gospels and I have committed my life into his hands. Life for me is an opportunity to serve him and death is a better opportunity to be with him. Therefore, I am not only satisfied to be in prison for the honour of his holy name, but I am ready to give my life for the sake of Jesus my Lord, 
and enter his kingdom the sooner, the place where the elect of God enter eternal life, but the wicked to eternal damnation. That man was soon after with his Lord in the noble band of martyrs. Let's pray. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous generation Of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Lord Jesus, we are ashamed that we've been ashamed of you. In our daily lives, again and again, we've been silent when we should have spoken up. And we've stepped back when we should have stood forward. Forgive us our fear. Thank you for your word, for the plain speaking that you made. And we pray that as a company of your people here, by your grace and mercy and through your strength, we may be willing to acknowledge you and your teaching, and especially that we would be faithful to your covenant, that we may continue to love you as you've loved us and to to pass on the good news, this truth, to others. Thank you for faithful martyrs in various parts of the world where today they're being persecuted for righteousness sake even to the point of death we pray that you'd continue to strengthen our faithful brothers and sisters and mercifully uphold them by your grace in the midst of their persecutions give them to be faithful men and women even faithful to death use them and their words too we pray which they have spoken concerning the crucified Christ whose death brings them life and grant to their persecutors we pray even uh, that some of them may come to know and to acknowledge the Saviour grant that we would be faithful unto you until the coming glory of our Saviour is seen and known as he comes with the glory of the Father and all the holy angels when we will receive We trust your gracious commendation. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen. Amen.